Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. A lot of things to talk about. President Biden on his first trip to Asia and Secretary of State Tony Blinken has a big speech on China. Then we'll look at the end game in Ukraine. Is there a split within uh, the West on what the end game should be? And finally, we'll look at a looming crisis, the global food crisis, uh, impacted by the fact that wheat and grains cannot leave Ukraine uh, for uh, people around the world. Looking at all of this this week with us is Bethany Allen Ibrahimian, China reporter for Axio. She's joining us from Washington. Bethany, great to see you. Great to be here. And Susan Glasser, staff writer and columnist for The New Yorker. Susan is also joining us from Washington. Susan, great to have you back. Thanks so much, Evo. And Giles Wittell, who is the World Affairs Editor at Tortoise Media, joining us from London. Giles, great to have you. Hello. Bethany, let's start with you. Uh, big, big Asia month really coming to a close, but a really big week with Biden traveling to Seoul, to, uh, uh, to Tokyo, a meeting with the Quad, and then a big speech yesterday uh, by Tony Blinken about uh, the, pre the administration's China policy. Uh, bring us up to date about where the administration wants to go when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region. Sure. So the Biden administration's big focus in the Asia-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific has been building institutions, creating new institutions and strengthening ones that already exist. And this week was absolutely, that is exactly what we saw, uh, launch of a new organization or, or a, a new multilateral structure, the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is not a, it's not going to be a free trade agreement. Uh, they, they want it to be the Biden administration recognizes the limitations they face domestically, politically. So it will be done through executive action and not through, a, you know, not through legislative action. So it's more limited than a free trade agreement, but it's going to look at standard, you know, digital standards, labor standards. And there are already 12 countries in the Indo-Pacific that have signed on to that. So that was a big diplomatic, you know, strong point, a big diplomatic win this week for Biden. Also a meeting of the Quad, which is really, you know, that was first built up during the Trump administration after years of uh, not doing very much with it. And a big meeting of the Quad. Um, and also, then there was Blinken's, you know, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken's speech yesterday. And it kind of capped it all off with the administration's first big public statement of it, of what its China strategy really is. And I would, I would put that into sort of two parts. The first part of it, diplomacy. Diplomacy, 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 working together with allies and partners to uphold the multilateral, uh, you know, liberal, international, rules-based world order, whatever you want to call it, upholding that. And that was, you know, that was, that was the, the, the top line of the speech. And the second for his speech yesterday was play, putting out very plainly that China poses the most serious challenge to that world order. It was really interesting because Blinken in his speech yesterday, the first country he mentioned as an adversary was Russia, not China, talking about Ukraine, talking about the challenge that the world was facing, especially that the West was facing. But he said, that is not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is, is China. He laid it out very plainly. The last point I'll, I'll leave us with um, is, is that despite the very different tone that Blinken struck in his speech compared to the Trump administration's first big China speech, which was Vice President Mike Pence in October 2018 at Hudson Institute uh, talking about China very different tone. Uh, you know, Pence's speech was a bit fire and brimstone, almost like an indictment of what China was doing. But in substance, the different things that they mentioned once Blinken did get into the specifics of the kinds of challenges uh, that, that China is, is, you know, putting towards that liberal order, the substance was very similar, talking about um, you know, the maritime, uh, maritime claims, um, the spying um, technology, forced technology transfer, uh, trade, you know, um, breaking world trade uh, rules, uh, challenge, you know, ideological challenge, all, you know, the authoritarian challenge, you know, Xi Jinping hit all the same notes. And that is exactly what I would have expected, because that's exactly what we've seen from the Biden administration, which is a continuation of the Trump administration's China policies, but a very different tone. 
Uh, and even he even used a similar word, reciprocity, which surprised me because it was such a because the Trump administration really put their stamp on reciprocity as, you know, that there isn't reciprocity in the U.S.-China relationship. You know, that China has access to things because we're an open society, but we don't have access to theirs. We even saw Blinken mention that yesterday as a concern. So I would say ideological continuity or not ideological, but let's say strategic continuity with the Trump administration, but a bigger focus on allies and partners and um, an attempt to walk back some of that, the most contentious language. Uh, very interesting, Susan. I, I, I think uh, uh, Bethany hits on a really important point, tone versus substance. I mean, it, not only Pence's speech uh, that Bethany mentioned, but Mike Pompeo did a couple of speeches, including memorably at the Nixon Library, in which he talked about China in terms that really was, uh, you know, 1950s. Uh, uh, in terms of depicting the Red Scare and, and, and not talking about China, but the Chinese Communist Party and, and calling Xi Jinping the, not the president of China, but the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, really making that case. But in substance, the policy is not that different other than the diplomacy and the allies, which I think is clearly a very big, uh, a, a big shift, as, as Bethany said. But in terms of the co competition with China, nice words, but is this, uh, is this really a, a wolf in sheep's clothing when it comes to U.S. policy towards China? Is that how we should think about it? Well, these are great questions, and I would say that they're not fully answered. While it was, the, you know, sort of meant to be this big rollout, I, I still came away from the week actually with a lot of questions that I think are actually fundamentally unanswered about the Biden policy toward China, primarily around the question of trade and economic competition with China. It's, you know, sort of a, a useful slogan to say, well, you know, China's the one that uh, is pursuing. Uh, it was a very interesting phrase, actually, that I thought Tony Lincoln used, which was um, uh, asymmetrical decoupling, essentially, you know, forcing the rest of the world, uh, you know, to remain as dependent as possible on them while they themselves become less dependent. That was a very interesting concept that they rolled out. So I thought that was new. But I, I still have enormous numbers of questions. First of all, why have they kept Trump era tariffs in place for so long? What is it that they're hoping to trade? I think what we didn't see and the reason for that, according to my reporting, and you have better sources than I do on this, Evo, but is that there's a huge divide inside the Biden administration. It's not often reported on. This has been a pretty opaque administration when it comes to foreign policy. They've kept their disagreements to themselves, unlike the Trump folks who tended to, uh, you know, battle with each other in uh, almost full public view. But, you know, I think there is a fundamental series of uh, unresolved disagreements inside the Biden team, which is partially why we don't have answers to some questions around their economic approach to China, number one, and number two, uh, their uh, the unresolved security issues around Taiwan and what exactly should we make of President Biden's uh, very unambiguous uh, reply and then ambiguous response to the pushback uh, when it came to the question of whether the US, U.S. would defend Taiwan. But I, one other point you, you've you made that I would like to underscore as well, which is it is not just rhetorical and it is not just a minor point of difference to say, oh, well, it's just like the Trump policy, except for a focus on the allies. Because in fact, I think one of the things that really came through for us in reporting this, this book about Trump and the White House that's going to come out this fall is the extent to which, A, it wasn't just words, and B, like Donald Trump came far closer than I think people understand to truly blowing up uh, not just our relationship with our European allies and NATO, but also our dealings with both South Korea and Japan. This is These were radical, uh, potentially alliance-ending steps that Donald Trump tried to take again and again and again throughout his administration and was actually only at the very end of his tenure, in the midst of the catastrophe of COVID, uh, that he gave up once and for all uh, on these, you know, pulling out of South Korea, uh, pulling out of Japan. He told us in an interview for the book, uh, again, he's not a super credible source, but, you know, insisted that in his second term, he would be doing uh, lots more to uh, essentially stick up South Korea and force them to pay billions of dollars or lose all US troops on the peninsula. And because this was a recurring theme of what he said from the very beginning of his tenure, uh, it means that it is an issue that he would have continued to bring up, uh, not just an idle whim and certainly not just uh, empty tweets or rhetoric. And I think that uh, was a big mistake that we all collectively made actually of not 
you know, of actually seeing a lot of the most threatening things that he said as just uh, rhetoric when, in fact, uh, it was really per policies he tried to pursue and, it, you know, he was regrouping in order to pursue them. Yeah. Uh, on, that, on that point, I mean, I, obviously that's totally correct. And I think something about, you know, the Trump administration's China policy is, I mean, there were many factions in the Trump administration, including Trump himself, right? But by the end, a lot of the, you know, the China policy, the China strategy, those people were very much opposed to what Trump was doing. So from an aggregate, of course, that is, you know, the Trump administration was also the, the president who wanted to do these things. But the people who formulated the China strategy largely, especially by the end, were very opposed and were, you know, horrified because their strategy really did rely on those partnerships. And so it, it depends on who you talk to about what the Trump administration strategy was, and especially in the National Security Council, you know, they were doing a lot of these partnerships. In fact, the Quad was built up, you know, during the Trump administration, but they had these, you know, there were these wildly divergent goals uh, and ide ideologies truly at play. So uh, let, let's go back to, 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 to the Biden administration. I mean, uh, and, 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 and we will read all of this in Susan and Peter Baker's uh, book uh, out, out this fall uh, on, on the Trump administration um, uh, when, when it does come out. Uh, but Giles, I think there are two, two questions for you that I think are, are part of it. One is uh, 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 Blinken did play sort of even more than lip service to the, the importance of the European alignment on China and thinking through how uh, the Europeans need to be part of this, this more competitive policy, including on the industrial and particularly high technology sectors, uh, uh, and, and, and talked about the EU-US uh, Trade and, and Technology Council as a means to it. Of course, there's a bilateral dialogue with the UK on this. So I'd be interested in, in sort of what you think the European reaction is, is to the speech and whether there's now a greater alignment on the U.S.-European view when it comes to China and the Indo-Pacific. And then secondly is this ruckus that, that Susan uh, uh, talked about uh, re regarding Taiwan uh, and the question of, okay, what is the president of the United States getting us into? Uh, are we, uh, as allies of the United States, uh, being potentially dragged into a war against China in order to defend Taiwan, and shouldn't we have something to say about it? And what's the view in 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 Europe about the message that is being sent when the president, not once, not twice, but three times, uh, makes a commitment to Taiwan, and the White House, including Tony Blinken in his speech, walks it back? Well, on on the first of those, um, I think you can see that even before the Blinken speech, in fact. Uh, a couple of years before the process started in the UK of um, what Janet Yellen now calls uh, friendshoring supplies of uh, critical uh, services, commodities that had been sourced from China uh, to, to Scandinavia in the case of our 5G network. I mean, I think um, even though the Biden administration's least favorite European partner at the moment seems to be the UK, they'll find a, a, a very willing uh, Johnson administration in terms of um, getting in line on 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 that part of of the the, the Blinken China strategy. Um, at ditto on on Taiwan, you'll find in Liz Truss and Ben Wallace, uh, uh, the the UK uh, Foreign uh, Se and Defence Secretaries, respectively, um, two people who have profited personally from a gung ho approach to the conflict in Ukraine and will, I think, take a very similar approach uh, in, in relation to putting down new lines in the sand on Taiwan. They, easy for them, isn't it? They're, they're a long way away. And, and the much bigger question, as you suggest, is, is what about the rest of the EU? What about, what about the 27th? And um, uh, I think just as you have seen um, divisions appear within the EU on, on Ukraine, you will see some much more cautious um, approaches on the part of uh, EU NATO members to the idea of a hard red line uh, and, and uh, uh, milit a military deterrence-based approach to, to the Taiwan problem. Um, I, per personally, uh, and I never thought I would be in this position, I, I favor a hawkish approach at both ends of the Eurasian landmass at the moment. Um, I, th I think, strangely, we're at a, a point in history when there is an opportunity to uh, make some very uh, uh, clear positions clear. 
an opportunity to make clear positions clear uh, uh, before we jump over to to uh, the, the other side of the Euro-Asia landmass, uh, Bethany and Susan, love to get your take on on sort of uh, starting with you, Bethany, uh, on this Taiwan issue, uh, which, which, you know, the way I read it is when the president says something three times, you ought to take him seriously. I, I really do think that he believes that the United States should commit to defending Taiwan if it is attacked by China. Uh, uh, and which is, by the way, not inconsistent with strategic ambiguity. It's just that you're saying it. Uh, which may be inconsistent with it. Uh, but why, if that's the case, is the rest of the administration continuing to kind of ignore the commander in chief? Yeah, it's fascinating. And it reminds me actually, to some extent, of what happened in the Trump administration, where you know Trump would tweet something out and then the administration would kind of, you know, kind of frantically try to walk it back. Uh, it's it's interesting that it keeps happening. And I agree with you completely that when he said it three times, it is very clear that this is what he believes. The problem is that, you know, U.S. policy on Taiwan is this extremely delicate diplomatic dance where the, you know, the difference between the, chi the one China policy and the one China principle could undo 30 years of, you know, very careful diplomatic um, negotiating. And so for him to come in and sort of unilaterally change the, the status quo in our position is something that, if it were allowed to stand on its face, would be, you know, an, a massive change in our unilateral, uh, you know, position on, on what our relationship is with, with Taiwan. But, you know, to Susan's point about divisions within the administration, I, I don't have insight into what exactly is going on behind Biden's statements. And I don't know if this is all planned to be this way. I, I doubt it. Uh, you know, are there people who are trying to hold him back who are, you know, maybe a little bit more Susan Thornton-ish, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, Obama and early Trump administrations who, you know, think that the U.S. being too close to Taiwan is itself very destabilizing and they want to pull him back from that? I I'm not I'm not clear on that. Susan, any insight on that? Well, I, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I, it's important to note that this isn't the first go round on this question of strategic ambiguity. And actually, George W. Bush had a very similar incident uh, in which he essentially confirmed this. It, it leads one strongly to under, you know, suggest that inside the U.S. government, in fact, the understanding has been the same for a long time and it has involved uh, a military commitment to Taiwan that uh, China, of course, would be well aware of, by the way. It's, it, it reminds me a lot of these sort of angels dancing on the head of a pin debates that we've been having about Russia and Putin and, you know, what level of U.S. involvement is too much when, you know, Vladimir Putin already thinks that the U.S. is running the whole war, right? And so in a way, uh, they, they're taking on a, a level of a little bit of an absurdity about the public discourse. And I think the same could arguably be said to be true uh, with regards to Taiwan, where the Chinese certainly would not be doing their job intelligence-wise uh, were they to actually be uh, uh, confused about the level and nature of U.S. support. Uh, so you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes further. But I, I agree with Evo that there is a price to be paid by the administration for undercutting, for appearing again and again to undercut the leadership of the president. Uh, and uh, at a moment when his leadership is in question and his approval ratings have plummeted and Republicans have mounted a sustained assault on the very notion of Biden as a leader, you know, calling him weak and, you know, frankly, before he even took the job, uh, it's really questionable whether that should be, uh, they should reevaluate that. I mean, I think it does pay a price for them in terms of uh, the overall perception of both the cloud of their president and their leadership to be continuing to do this. Just a, a historical footnote, and Giles will come back in a second. Uh, of course, the, the the George W. Bush statement that you mentioned was uh, eviscerated in an op-ed in the in the Washington Post by the senior senator of Delaware uh, at the time as being uh, completely unwise and show that uh, the president didn't know what he was talking about. That senior senator, of course, was uh, Joseph R. Biden the uh, third at the time. So just history comes around in different ways. When you've been in town as long as Joe Biden has been in town. Uh, this is this will happen. Like like they said about Trump, there's a tweet for everything. Um, Giles, your I, last point. I was just wanting to say that I'm sure Susan is right that when you have a president who is supposed to be walking a very narrow and taut diplomatic tightrope, it doesn't help if he's being constantly undermined, not just by uh, 
the other party, but but by elements within his own administration. But I see continuity here. I mean, it may be accidental, but isn't the net effect of a president saying one thing and an administration or staff is walking it back precisely the strategic ambiguity that is sought, even if it's only from the point of view of keeping international peace? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Maybe we just have redefined what strategic ambiguity is. Uh, the president says one thing and the White House says something else. And then we have to figure out who's actually true. And the Chinese will have to figure that out. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it sounds facetious, but no, but no, no, I think you're absolutely right. And maybe, you know, maybe there's more, uh, more logic to the madness that we're seeing. Um, uh, so I, I, I take it. I take the point. Uh, Susan, let's switch over uh, to, uh, to uh, what, what really is becoming, it, it looks like a debate. Uh, both within the administration, although a little less than that, um, but really between uh, among the allies writ large, about what the end game uh, uh, in uh, in both Russia and with regard, uh, sorry, in, in both Ukraine and with regard to Russia, uh, I think the two are being conflated in this debate uh, in, in in an interesting way. Uh, uh, it, it took, of course, a ninety nine year old <laughs> uh, right. former Secretary of State to. Uh, to uh, uh, put this uh, in uh, in people's uh, uh, radar screen, uh, Henry Kissinger, who in Davos said that uh, maybe it was time for Ukraine to give up some territory in order to to get to peace. Uh, but there is this more fundamental issue: what are we trying to achieve in Ukraine, and what are we trying to achieve with Russia? Yeah, I thank you for framing it that way, Eva, because I do think, you know, it tends to be um, some of these conversations can be understandably infuriating and maddening to Ukrainians and, and others who are in the direct line of fire of Russia, because uh, it's very easy for Henry Kissinger at Davos to talk about, uh, you know, trading uh, land for peace, right? Uh, but come on, right? And so I think the bigger question really actually is the more salient one, uh, which is what is, a, what is a, uh, an end game that would look reasonable but also, where are we militarily? And I, I fear sitting here in Washington, I have to be honest, I, I've thought a lot about this over the last week. I actually fear that we've overcorrected our conventional wisdom in the uh, wrong direction. And understandably, there was an, a sense of relief that, you know, even translated into a bit of euphoria when people realized that Ukraine held, that it did not fall, that Putin's initial plan failed, that the Battle of Kiev was over and the Ukrainians had won. And what you now see, though, here in Washington, you had Republican senators in the middle of voting for an incredible $40 billion aid package for Ukraine, literally something that was unthinkable. <laughs> uh, you know, these Republican senators are willing to give more money to Ukraine than to COVID uh, uh, relief here inside the United States, you know, at this moment in time. It's a fascinating political uh, shift that's occurred uh, almost overnight in, in Washington political terms. And you had them on the floor of the United States Congress saying, oh, well, you know, basically Ukraine's going to win and it's going to defeat Russia and we're going to sort of leave Russia supine for a generation. Well, you know, the Russians still have a vote on the ground here. And if you look at the reporting, which is hard, you know, to understand, incomplete, fog of war and all that. But if you look at the reporting from what's actually happening on the ground, if you speak with, uh, you know, people who are paying very close attention to the actual war war part of this, I think it's pretty clear that uh, these views of a quick victory by Ukraine boosted by Western military aid are unrealistic. And uh, the clear-eyed analysts probably still are sticking with what Avril Haines, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, testified to just last week, after all, which was the prospects are most likely of a long-term war of attrition that lasts years, not months, that includes Russia not only continuing to wage its fight in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine, but not giving up its bigger territorial claims on other parts of Ukraine and its broader goal for the war of essentially regime change and uh, potentially creeping annexation of all or part of Ukraine as continuing to be the goal. And again, if you look at the insane over-the-top propaganda from Russia, which has gone into full-throated existential war against Ukraine. Uh, this is not being framed in terms of, well, guys, we just want to like bite off a little piece and then we'll be satisfied and we'll bring the boys home. 
this is all out campaign against an unstate and an unpeople. And how do you negotiate with that, Henry Kissinger? You know, how do you negotiate with that? Come on. Uh, and I just, I feel like the conversation from day one that you've seen out of some of the Western allies, particularly uh, the French, uh, 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 the Germans, some of the Germans, although there's been a marked shift, they've had a harder time, I think, bringing along actions uh, to accompany, I think, a more clear-eyed view of Russia that you've certainly seen from the German leadership. They haven't been as forthcoming with uh, actions, but certainly they have been perhaps a little bit more clear-eyed. You know, and again, I just, it's astonishing when you can, the strong, strong weight of evidence in history suggests that American and Western European appeasement, and that's what it is, appeasement of Vladimir Putin is the reason that we have this war today. As we speak, Putin and his soldiers are eviscerating, eviscerating Ukrainian cities. Uh, they are mass deporting Ukrainian citizens. They are preparing uh, political annexation of territories that have only recently come under their control. And they are undertaking any number of war crimes and filtration camps. And I would like to hear, you know, some of uh, the rhetoric from uh, France and Germany and elsewhere talk about that. You know, I just, how are you going to tell those people to negotiate away their territory? So I actually think that the good news for your listeners, Evo, is that they can probably tune out, frankly, a little bit from uh, the daily kind of like off ramp for Putin question mark uh, stories because that's not going to be happening, to be honest. Yeah, I think the uh, the Ukrainians aren't, uh, aren't aren't have a vote as in this as well as you as you say. So do the Russians and 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 Giles. I think we we, we have uh, seen that, of course, that the economic bite is taking is starting to take its toll in uh, in Russia itself, but increasingly it's taking a toll uh, uh, among the Europeans and and sort of the wind uh, in the European sails of sanctions seems to have uh, uh, slowed down a little bit. The sixth sanction package is stuck because Hungary doesn't want to uh, do an oil embargo. And we haven't been talking about a gas embargo for a long time. Right. Uh, and there seems to be this building pressure, particularly in the West uh, 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 of the EU, uh, much less, of course, in Eastern Europe, where it's closer to Russia, to say, we need to find a way out of this thing uh, uh, with, the, with the subtext that we need to get back to some semblance of normal. And the normal is engaging with Russia, even despite whatever has happened. Is, is, that, uh, is that debate live in, in, in Europe or, or is the change that we saw post February 24th going to say, no, it's just taking longer, but in the end, the relationship between Europe and Russia is gonna be fundamentally different because of the reasons that Susan laid out. Uh, and, uh, and we're just trying to figure out how to get from here to there. You're right that the unanimity of February 25th is, is no longer there. You're right that there was a very clear imperative from then, from before then, that the most powerful thing that the EU could possibly do was to agree a full energy embargo. It might not have been able to go into practice at once, but a plan that one would be achieved, say, within months or, or, or perhaps a year. Agreement on that as you note, uh, has not been possible because uh, not just of, of Hungary, but um, uh, of incomplete sanctions. For example, this extraordinary situation which you had last week of uh, imports of Russian oil to a particular refinery in Italy increasing rather than decreasing despite sanctions, because they all came uh, from Luke Oil, which for some bizarre reason amongst uh, American producers has not been sanctioned. Um, but there are, and, and then of course, behind the curtain of sanctions, Russia is is having no difficulty selling energy at a discount else, elsewhere in the world. Um, but uh, when when Susan started her remarks um, and and sounding astonished by the scale of the the forty billion appropriation in Congress, uh, where I'm sitting, you know, five time zones closer. Um, I, uh, as a citizen and as a journalist, welcomed that as appropriate to the moment. 
And and I entirely agree. Where does where does Kissinger get off? Uh, or indeed the New York Times editorial a couple of days earlier, um, which elicited a furious response, not just um, in, in Kyiv, but amongst the growing, uh, slowly growing Ukrainian emigre community here, a, a few of whom we now employ at Tortoise. Um, uh, where does the New York Times get off uh, preaching appeasement at this at this point in in the in in the process? Um, and uh, you're right that we're a long way from uh, Europe getting behind putting those kinds of resources that, that the Congress has appropriated into into the military fight. Uh, will it? I mean, the, the the scale is different by an order of magnitude. Germany is supposed to have changed dramatically its approach to arming combatants, but still it's a billion euros. Um, uh, a great deal depends on Germany, of course, over the next over the next six months. And I'm still prepared to give Olaf Scholz the benefit of the doubt as someone new to the job, um, uh, uh, na naturally person personally inclined to get his ducks in a row before shooting his mouth off, unlike many politicians in my own country. Um, and, but uh, unfortunately, I think it, it may be true that um, in France, in Italy, and in Germany, those voices to which you allude, uh, seeking some kind of a return to some kind of business as usual, will prevail. And of course, you see, uh, Yale University has this terrific list of, of um, multinationals uh, and uh, listed according to whether they're still doing business in Russia. Uh, many, many have pulled out, but many also are just playing wait and see. Um, but it, just the final thing I'd say is, uh, uh, I, I, I do think that this is a world historical moment. Um, and as Rahm Emanuel says, uh, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. This is an opportunity to, uh, to humiliate Putin. Um, and, and it's the first one of its kind since 1991. And, and that's why I applaud both sides in Congress for at least what it seems like from where I'm sitting, understanding that. It turns out, actually, I think that uh, Churchill is the one who said, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. And, but and, uh, and and Michael it appropriated own. it, didn't he? <laughs> but you're just, but as, 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 as uh, Bob Gates once told me, the difference between a government and academics is they both steal from others, but academics use footnotes. Um, <laughs> and, and so <laughs> that's, that's the nature of the business. Beth, Beth, uh, Bethany, uh, your, your view on sort of the end game in and of itself, and also I, I'm really interested to see you know, the Chinese, at the, in, when they were looking at, at the Western unity, uh, uh, might have been surprised initially. Are they now looking at these fissures to say, see, you know, all these guys really can't keep it together and you just stick it out long enough, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be fine uh, as they think about their own uh, strategic aims uh, in their own region or, and indeed beyond. I think Beijing is really leaning into the authoritarian axis uh, and they're really accepting that this is the world that we have right now, that, uh, that this is the world that we're, that we're looking at, where uh, you know, there's going to be a growing split between the West and Russia and China or the West and the rest, which is what Beijing would like it to be. We I mean, look at the new security pact that Beijing has recently launched. This is, to me, stunning. I know it seems boring. It makes few headlines, but compare this to you know, the so this is the, decades... This is this mm -hmm. is the, the new security pact with the yes, United Nations forget, in the South Pacific. Yes. Oh, uh, no, not that or, one. Uh, although that I think is probably conceptually part of it. But there's a, a few a few weeks ago, Beige, uh, Xi Jinping announced a global security initiative that's in all capital letters, which is basically, you know, Xi Jinping saying, you know, we're going to have our own counterweight now. Officially on paper, here's what it's called. It's called the Global Security Initiative. You have NATO. We're going to have this. Um, he just laid it all out there. And that's what we've seen from Xi Jinping over and over and over again is breaking with, you know, decades of China's norms. One of them is saying, you know, we don't want another Cold War. We're not going to we're not going to have alliances. You know, they have been, you know, non-alignment has really been a big policy of theirs. And he's just, you know, put that all to the wind. And, you know, if you compare, if you if you want to put that in the context of Ukraine, I mean, that I think has been incredibly informative for China's leaders to, to watch all of that unfold. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to say, you know, one way or the other, yes, that means that they're absolutely not going to invade Taiwan right now or, or 
you know, no, it means that they, um, uh, you know, that they have decided that actually it's a great thing to do. I, I don't think that they're, it's a, that, that kind of a black and white answer for them. Um, but, you know, look at how, look at how in our discussions of Ukraine, you know, we, you know, we're just talking about appeasement. You get the exact same conversations a lot of times from the exact same camps about Taiwan. There have been numerous, you know, prominent voices in the U.S. and the West who say we should just let China take Taiwan. You know, that's that's all they want. They don't have bigger ambitions. You know, that's that that's all they want. And I, I would say this, guys, this is the same thing. I mean, look at you know, look at look at this new South Pacific. Uh, you know, eight eight island nations in the South Pacific. You know, Beijing basically saying they want to have you know military security agreements with all of them. Global Security Initiative. Um, you know, so there's this really interesting map you can look at if you these with these eight island nations, uh, Pacific island nations, and you include their you know uh, exclusive economic zones. They they, they all connect and it forms uh, an island chain that would you know separate very effectively separate the U.S. from Australia and would you know break any supply chains if we tried to defend Australia from an attack. So you know the the idea that there's this sort of magic if we can just sort of swallow our pride and, and let them have what they want that that will end it. Of course, that's not true. You know, 30 years of, uh, uh, of working in a world in which we didn't think about deterrence and competition and defense and, and uh, uh, being serious is, is uh, we're, we're relearning how to do that. Uh, and we're relearning it with regard to, uh, to, to uh, Russia and we're relearning it with regard to China. Um, and, and it's not all clear that we, we still have that muscle memory uh, as we go, uh, go ahead. And that's why a lot of people are still looking for uh, solutions short of, uh, uh, of figuring out how the balance of power in the end is going to be what, what drives uh, all of this, um, uh, this discussion. Uh, uh, there are consequences, however, uh, Giles, the last, uh, just switching over to the last topic, the real consequences when you do have uh, uh, major conflicts between great powers uh, and that, uh, that touch many people who are not part of it. And in this case, uh, there is a consequences for food uh, the breadbasket of the world is Ukraine and, 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 and Russia together. Uh, they they uh, uh, account for much of the world's grains and wheats uh, that the rest of the world depends on. And it, much of it is stuck uh, in ports and in silos uh, throughout Ukraine. Uh, you just had a, 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 a interview in, 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 in your um, uh, in, in Tortoise Media with uh, David Beasley, the head of the, the World Food Program uh, in Davos. Uh, who has really raised this issue uh, to the fore, as as have others, uh, with a major UN uh, meeting in the Security Council just a couple of uh, of a week ago or so. Uh, tell us where we are and 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 how do we get out of this mess? God, I wish I knew the answers to the uh, second question. Where we are is we're between the first and second harvests. Um, about twenty million tons of Ukrainian grain is sitting in silos, uh, waiting. Uh, in an ordinary year, they would be shipped straight out uh, of the Dardanelles to uh, export markets, as you say, across the world, but primarily lower and middle income countries, um, many of them in Middle East and, and North Africa. We did a, a sort of schema where you have the X and the Y axis showing you which countries are really in the crosshairs. And while the, the World Food Programme singles out Yemen, Somalia and, and Afghanistan, the, the data also shows Lebanon, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Indonesia as the key countries that uh, will now not get grain from Ukraine as they ordinarily would. We'll have to seek it elsewhere at inflated prices. Um, so then th th two questions, as, as you say, how, how to get it out. The land option really isn't an option. Uh, it, it turns out that one big bulk carrier ship can carry about as much grain as 50, five zero whole trains. Um, and the trains are only an option, really, as you point out in your excellent primary vote in Politico, um, if the gauges leading from Ukraine to neighboring countries are the same, but they're not. Uh, roads are only really an option if they're not uh, vulnerable to rocket attacks. Um, so uh, the overwhelming priority is to open uh, maritime corridors and the debate is on as we speak as to whether uh, Russia will allow them. Um, you were pointing out before we came on that uh, it would probably be require 
sophisticated minesweepers of the kind that aren't in the region right now to make sure it was safe um, of, of the kind that the Turkish Navy doesn't have. It would, it would also require Russian cooperation. And so far, they've uh, made that conditional upon sanctions relief, which um, I don't think is uh, up for negotiation at the moment. Um, so the question then arises, do you enforce a grain corridor, as it were? And this is something that, that you've written about, and I'll defer to you on the, 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 the mechanics of that and whether it's possible, whether it's advisable. But I'll only say that I would agree with you that we're in a position uh, where that is a risk worth taking and certainly a different order of risk, by which I mean lower, than um, trying to impose a no-fly zone, which of course you would fly directly and literally into uh, military uh, conflict between NATO and, and, and Russia, which would not necessarily be, be the case defending a maritime grain corridor. But yes, um, food supplies for um, 350 to 400 million people at risk. The only thing I would note, really interestingly, just before we started, I looked at world grain prices right now, and markets are, are very sensitive to everything they see coming across their screens and prices which have trebled roughly uh, in the past uh, year um, are dipping again. So markets at any rate think that this talk of grain corridors across the Black Sea might actually lead somewhere. Um, uh, thanks, Giles. I think that's a, that lays it out really, really well. Uh, and, and, and Susan, um, uh, the, the key here is we're running out of time uh, because as, as Giles said, we're in between two harvests and the second harvest, which is due within 30 days or so starting, uh, cannot find a place to be stored unless the storage of the first harvest is actually moved out. Uh, and that's really uh, the, 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 the linchpin. Uh, in your reporting, do you see anybody in Washington uh, or indeed anywhere else in, in, in Europe other than the Lithuanians who have proposed the Coalition of the Willing uh, to do the kind of escorting of tankers that we did uh, back in the late 80s in, in the Persian Gulf when the Iranians were mining Iraqi oil ships uh, during their war uh, with, uh, uh, with Iraq? Uh, is this a live debate in Washington? And if not, why not? Well, you and I have spoken about this. I, m my view is that it should be, it, it, it is out there, but it is not a live debate, number one. Number two, it, isn't it interesting to contrast this with our previous conversation about uh, uh, Kissingerians in Paris and elsewhere uh, wanting to talk about an end to the war, why aren't they talking about something much more constructive that would actually help people that might be an evidence of Russian good faith in order to even begin to conceive of what the end of the war would look like? I mean, it seems to me those are exactly the people who ought to be engaged in a conversation around, uh, you know, a grain corridor and aren't. Uh, as far as I can tell, in any meaningful way, especially given the shortness of time that Giles has correctly pointed out, you know, that's the dynamic driving things here. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to do nothing. And we've seen that again and again and again when it comes to Russia. Uh, and, you know, you always have the excuse of, well, it could be escalatory. And so uh, I, I'm afraid that that's, that's an all-purpose excuse right now. Uh, and so I don't there's nothing that indicates to me, let me put it this way, that somehow in the next month, we're going to miraculously pull together a major international coalition uh, and uh, get ships in the Black Sea doing anything like this, unfortunately. So I don't, I don't see it happening in a, in a practical sense. Uh, Bethany, we only got a minute left. I want to turn to you because, of course, the Chinese market uh, is part of the global uh, of the global market, and, and and Chinese wheat production this year is uh, is uh, well below the norm because of uh, I believe a lot of wet uh, rain and, and and everything else. So the Chinese are going to be out in the market asking and trying to find both uh, both uh, wheat and and food for for their animals uh, uh, feedstock uh, that is going to have an impact on on the market. Uh, might they be? part of a solution and pushing the Russians in to say, listen, we really got to solve this issue. This is, goes beyond the, your immediate war with Ukraine, or are they going to step back and say, we'll just figure out how to pay for the wheat that we need and the rest of the world take care of themselves? I would go with the latter. What we've seen from China is an absolute unwillingness to push Russia uh, in a way that they don't want to be pushed on Ukraine. Uh, we have not seen 
uh, you know, try to try to talk sense into Russia. Uh, we have we have not seen anything like that. What we have seen is um, China's, you know, uh, vocal support for Russia, the support that their media outlets give to amplifying Russian disinformation. Um, and, you know, we've seen um, from uh, from Chinese, you know, Chinese companies, now Chinese companies have done the bare minimum to, because they don't want to be shut out of the rest of the world too, because of secondary sanctions. And this is something that really irks Beijing. But no, I, I am not, we have not seen uh, China in any way try to urge Russia to be a responsible global stakeholder. And I do not see why China would urge them to do that in this case, use some of that leverage that they have. I think it would be much easier for China to simply buy what they need. They, as you said, they, they have the money um, and that's, that's what I expect from them. It's a sad way to end. Uh, I think as the economist rightly put it, it takes a world to feed the world and the world is so fractured that uh, parts of the world are no longer being fed. Uh, and that's the situation we find ourselves in on, on this Friday before uh, uh, Memorial Day. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Bethany Giles and Susan for really uh, great insights here uh, on all the issues that we discussed. Uh, and uh, thank you all for tuning in and, and listening and come back next week for another edition of World Review. Until then, bon weekend. <laughs>